Hello and welcome to the Ideal Investor Show. My name is Axel Meyerhofer and I'm the host of the Ideal Investor Show, where we show you the path to early retirement. If you introduce yourself a little bit, I know that You've done a lot of house flipping and now you do storage solutions. So maybe a little bit of how did you get where you are today? Sure. Yeah, so my name is Stephen Libman. I am the managing partner of Integrity Holdings Group, which is a real estate investment firm. I started in the real estate space about 15 years ago, first as a broker and an agent working for other people, sourcing deals for them so that they could do investment properties and flip houses and things like that. And um, after we did that for a couple of years, I thought, hey, you know, I think I could do this myself. And uh, we did. We started Integrity Holdings Group 11 years ago, and we started uh, wholesaling and flipping and grew that business to um, doing about 150 deals a year <clears throat> and learned very quickly that it's a very transactional, very highly taxed job. So, you know, we got into real estate kind of on the heels of reading um, Cash Flow Quadrant and Rich Dad Poor Dad and, you know, right. some of those kind of classics and realized that, you know, this flipping business was good. It created a lot of active income, but it wasn't the quadrant that we wanted to land in, which was the investor. Yeah. Okay. So, <clears throat> Although, I mean, being on the, on the business owner quadrant isn't the worst, right? <laughs> no, 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 it's good. I mean, look, it's, it's not the employee, right? You're, yeah, yeah. You're, you work for yourself and it's good. Um, but to, to create kind of generational wealth and more passive income and have some tax benefits, we recognized that single family wasn't going to be the end all solution. It was a great stepping stone to where we wanted to go, but really wanted to create more passive income for financial freedom. And, uh, so that's where we started looking into kind of what opportunities were out there. We were already right. buying single family houses. So we thought, right. oh, maybe we'll buy a single family house and just keep it and rent it, you know, and do a couple of those. And, um, you know, we started getting around some mentors that owned some larger apartment complexes and they kind of gave us the pros and cons of all of the different things. They said the, their biggest headaches were still their single family rentals that they had. <laughs> um, so we started looking into some bigger properties and I thought maybe 30, 40 units. Um, and we were told to go bigger still. And then we thought maybe 50, 60 units and we were told to go bigger still. And our first project was about three years ago. It was a ground up construction self storage facility. It was 1,193 units, about 135,000 square feet. And since then we've built three of them and we've acquired about 900 multifamily units and we're under contract for another 400 multifamily units. So that has been kind of the genesis of, uh, of the business and some of our background. And, you know, now we have a, a small team. We're investors first. We invest in uh, operators and projects that we believe in. And then we open the doors for our investors to come along for the ride with us. Okay, cool. Yeah, thank you for, for describing and, and, and displaying that. Then there's a lot in there, especially for the people that normally um, view our videos or podcasts and, and, and stories that we write and articles and stuff. So you said that you did some single family, which is kind of the space that we are mainly focusing on. And then you transitioned and thought to do multifamily. Can you maybe in a short way describe the difference between the typical residential loans and what you experience? And I'm, I'm not an expert in the storage space, but did some research on the multifamily. And I would kind of summarize that as commercial loans versus, um, you know, either government backed or non-government backed residential loans. So could you touch on that a little bit, how that's different? Yeah. So, I mean, when we were flipping, we were usually doing hard money lending, you know, okay. or, or, or private lending. So we flipped about a thousand houses, but we didn't use bank financing for a lot of those. Um, you know, you kind of get pigeonholed a little bit, right. As a real estate investor with four or five properties, unless you're going to potentially tell them that you're living there, which you're not, you know, so <laughs> that you get, you kind of get capped by the banks um, for residential loans, but the commercial side is, very different. It's one, you know, when you do hard money lending or even bank loans for residential, you have uh, it's the, the, the value of the property is predicated on the neighborhood, right? What, what your property is, what properties are selling for around you. So you get the appraisal and then you get the value of the property and that's how they come up with your debt to income ratios and things like that. 
or your uh, loan to values, things like that. So the commercial space is different in that it is predicated on net operating income, not the value of the properties around you. So that's why I like commercial as well is because you can predictably figure out how you can increase in income and decrease expenses to increase that net operating income and thereby increasing the value of the property over time. So, um, you know, unlike uh, 2007, eight, when the market crashed and everything kind of went down, that, that was precipitated by a four and a half percent to 5% mortgage default rate across the country. Multifamily was 0 0.04 default rate and uh, self-storage even less than that. So that's why Forbes calls self-storage the resistant, the recession resistant asset class. Um, so they're a little bit different in terms of the loans. Also with commercial loans, because it's based on the cash flow of the property, I don't have to personally guarantee the loan. So it's non-recourse rather than full recourse. So on your, your primary residence, you have recourse, meaning they can come after you personally if you don't pay the loan. In a property like a commercial building, they do such steep underwriting on it that they're underwriting the cash flow, not necessarily you as the borrower. You still need the net worth to sign on the loan, but you don't need to personally guarantee the loan. Yeah, absolutely. And I mean, for those people who are not that familiar, I want to just clarify that income is like if you take an apartment complex would be basically the rental income or what's left of the rental income after expenses. And I'm assuming you could kind of in a sense call the people who rent a storage unit tenants too, <laughs> in, yeah, a, in a way, even though they're not living in it, but they're leaving their stuff there. Actually, I mean, if you think about it, and I've lately written quite a bit and talked quite a bit of, you know, what can we as investors, regardless whether we do the kind of investing that you do or the residential investing expect with the rise in inflation and pointed to the fact that, and it's maybe even more so true for you in the storage space, right? Like as, as people may not be able to afford as big a space as they had before, they probably don't necessarily want to get rid of the things that are near and dear to them. So where do they go? They go to Stephen and put it in a storage unit, right? Because right. it's typically cheaper than than renting a place to, to store it in their garage or stuff like that. So that's one thing. Um, and in general, anytime prices increase and people need to leave stuff or they move somewhere or whatever the situation might be, there's, and we, I think, to some extent, and I would be interested to hear what you're saying about that, is we have been conditioned. I'm not saying right or wrong, good or bad, but we have in many ways been conditioned to believe that success as a person or as a family or as an individual is to a significant extent defined by the stuff you own. Right, like whether you have an RV or a fancy car or a couple of jet skis or um, I don't know, book collection, you name it. So I'm I'm again not saying this is right or wrong, but it seems like a lot of people accumulate over time a ton of things. And especially when they are things that you don't use all year round, they have to go somewhere. Right. right. Yeah, I mean self-storage was the only asset class to increase in value during the 2007 2008 downturn. Right. So that's, uh, you know, people, exactly people what went into for, when you foreclose on your house, it doesn't mean that you don't like the content of your house anymore. You know, so, yeah. so sure. that makes But so also as people downsized, you know, they didn't get yeah. rid of their stuff either. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. So it's, um, Especially when they um, not necessarily foreclose, but, you know, short sale or, you know, I had actually a person who became a tenant in, in one of my properties who owned um, a place was pretty close to upside down and then they went through a divorce mm -hmm. and when they need, when they basically forced themselves in a way to have to separate the, the assets and then it totally didn't work anymore. But right. after that, the question was, okay, where do we live? Right. And then many of my friends said, well, you want to be careful to, to uh, lease to somebody who had these kind of things in the past. And for me, the decision was easy to just review what happened. And it, they had always paid until they divorced, right? Mm. So that's a much more important thing. Their personal stuff, I don't really necessarily get involved with, but their history of payment. And um, so I, I think those are some of the criteria we all want to look at. And I'm pretty sure they apply whether you have property management in an apartment complex or you make a decision of how able are the people that rent space in your storage units, how able are they to actually consistently pay 
so that you don't have to what, what's that tv show where they open up the <laughs> storage unit oh yeah yeah storage wars uh-huh. <laughs> yeah right i don't know is that actually for real or uh, is that's that for just... real okay for real. so if somebody doesn't pay for how long and until you basically give it up for auction yeah i actually don't know what the metric is we we're, <laughs> third, <laughs> we're third party managed by one of the national companies cube smart manages all of our facilities oh cool um, okay But yeah, I don't know. It's it's not long though. I think it's 30, 60 days. It's oh, really? Okay. Quick. I thought it would be longer than that. Okay, cool. Um, now, one thing I wanted to ask you when, when Nadine started setting up our interview, um, you have the word integrity in the name of your business. So can you talk a little bit about that? I know that is not necessarily or doesn't have to necessarily be directly related to the mathematics of, of real estate investing. But it struck me as interesting, to say the least, that somebody uses that term. So I'm pretty sure there is probably reasoning behind it, right? There is. So uh, yeah, so we're, we're a Christian-owned and operated company. And uh, Proverbs 10.9 says that whoever walks in integrity walks securely, but whoever takes crooked paths will be found out. <clears throat> and it's just important for us. It's one of our core values. Um, in this space, I think in the real estate space, you have... Um, A lot of people looking to make a buck and maybe not always doing it the right way. So we didn't put that on our business card so that everybody else knew um, that we thought integrity was important. It was really as a reminder for ourselves of who we work for and what core values we require ourselves to be held to. Um, and that one day we'll be judged for that. So, you know, right. Right. Sure yeah. So uh, can you give some examples on, you know, for you, for your organization, for your team, and for the people that you work with, how does that in practical terms show up in, in daily life when, when you say, okay, this is in following our integrity rules, integrity expectations? Yeah, so I mean, the most practical way is it's an investor first model. You know, we're in the process of actually selling a property right now where our company won't really make much money on it. Um, but it was, it's the right thing to do for the investors to return their capital back and to give them the returns that they were promised. <clears throat> We could have probably held the property a couple more years and made more money on it, but we told them a three-year timeline and we're at a three-year timeline. If we held it for another two years, we'd probably make a couple hundred thousand dollars, uh, extra on it, small apartment complex, 66 units, um, But, you know, initially we told the, the clients, this is what you'll make. This is how long we're going to hold it. Um, and in practical terms, that's exactly what we're going to give them. Yeah. Well, I mean, I, like I said, I'm not claiming to know the multifamily space that well. But if I compare to at least the area that we are in with the residential, which, I mean, multifamily is in a sense part of that too. The last two of those three years weren't that bad, right? Yeah, well, this was a complete turnaround, gut refinish, and it was in a war zone. So, um, <laughs> yeah, I, I agree with you. The market has been good to us, and that's probably why we're able to sell and give the returns that we promised to the investors. Um, but this this particular property was a challenge. Yeah, absolutely. understand. And can you uh, spend maybe a minute? Because, I mean, I would probably compare this or it sounds a little bit like a syndication but can you explain because most people that are not necessarily that familiar with real estate investing would probably think okay i buy something i own it and I'm, i have maybe somebody manage it for me and then um, i either get the money or some of the money from my p uh, positive cash flow passive income and then if i sell i make some of the money on the gain between what i paid and and maybe renovation costs my plus, um, minus than or plus depending Um, what I sell it for. So when you say we're doing it for the investors, can you kind of give a little bit of an explanation how that works? I mean, you can call it syndication or not, but I think not everybody is familiar that you even have that option because part of why we do this is also not just to say we have the greatest only one way to do this because the real estate world is really, I hope you would agree, broad and has tons and tons of different options. But to educate, and, and since you're working with investors in those kind of deals, maybe you can describe a little bit what you mean when you speak about integrity towards what you promised in this context of investing. Yeah, so basically, um, real estate syndications just means many hands make light work. So you can get involved in larger projects and own a piece of a company that owns the underlying asset. 
So unlike a REIT, when you go to Wall Street and you buy a, 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 a REIT, you aren't directly investing into an asset. You're directly investing into a fund or a REIT that goes and spreads that out. The, the difference with that is you don't get the tax benefits of commercial real estate investing through a REIT. So instead of me just going out and buying a 10 unit building, right, I can pull some money together from some uh, other passive investors and go and buy a 66 unit or, you know, we just close on a 384 unit. So <clears throat> it gives people the option to be more passive, right? And uh, it's, it's similar to like very large multiplied turnkey investments. So turnkey investments, right? You just, you're a passive investor, you're collecting checks, somebody else is doing all the work. Same thing with a real estate syndication on a large multifamily or self-storage where the, uh, the rules changed in 2004, 2005, where it allowed for individual investors to invest directly into these deals. It used to be just for Wall Street, but now individuals are allowed to invest directly into these projects if you know people that are doing it, right? You need to know right, right, right. operators. Exactly. Yeah, which is good because now the people that listen and see our videos and podcasts can actually find out about Stephen and, and that he is offering this, this kind of stuff. Now, real quick, read is Real Estate Investing Trust or Investment Trust. So um, as a differentiation, uh, I think, and, and correct me if I uh, see this wrong, but a syndication, I guess, would be fair to say if you have like a $10 million deal, you can say, okay, people can buy 50,000 or 100,000 or 25,000, depending on however you want to break it up, units, however many of those units, and that gives them a percentage ownership within that deal and as that deal performs like you said i'm assuming you know when you say total gut it was a full renovation bringing up the rent roll to a much more desirable level which means the property performs much better and then also is worth more because it got improved this actually and you know when we i always find when we talk about real estate there are so many terms that people are not automatically familiar with right like sure. when you say, okay, look at your property tax bill, whether you are an investor or an owner, it has basically the land and the improvements, right? So improvement is basically what you put on the land and how you actually make it good or bad or let it go. So I, it sounds like in your deal that you were referring, it was pretty far down like this in disrepair and in, in this um, and neglect. And you brought it back. You made the units better. You renovated the property, made it more valuable and probably can rent more and have a higher desirability for people to live there, which increases what you said in the beginning, the amount of money that actually comes onto the balance sheet, which right. is ultimately what determines how much is it worth and how much can you sell it for three months later versus real estate investment trust is basically like stock investing, right? right. And, and um, you don't have nearly as much ownership. Now, I don't think we need to dive too deep, but in your in your syndications, do the um, owners have any say? Is there something like a committee or is it only the general manager who makes all the decisions? Yeah, so you have two classes of investor. You have the general partnership, which is the owner, the operator, which is me. And then you have the limited partnership. So they don't have to make any day-to-day -day decisions. We're managing the property. We're doing the property management. We're making all the major decisions because of our experience. The limited partner no decisions, also um, no liability past their in, initial investment, right? So I have to sign on the loans. We have to sign for the property management agreements, things like that. Uh, so the general partnership takes all that risk. The limited partnership is limited only to its investment amount. Right. Okay, great. Thanks for explaining that. So now how is that when you basically create a brochure and you invite people to become limited partners, you probably give them a certain amount of expectations on how the deal is going to run, not just in the length, but also in how much is going to come out of that. What happens if something doesn't work exactly how you have planned? So, I mean, it's really a virtue of underwriting and operations, right? Mm -hmm. So your track record is pretty important when you're, when you're looking at a deal, you know, that way. So if you're a limited partner looking at these things, there's a couple of questions that you need to be asking. Um, one, you, you should be really concerned about where they're getting their projections for rental increases. Mm -hmm. You know, a lot of people will come in and say, well, in five years, we're going to increase the rent by this much. Well, based on what, right? Is it population growth? Is it economic growth? Are there new jobs in the area? What's driving that? 
because you can't just project 3% a year kind of arbitrarily, right? Right. So exactly. that's that's something that you want to be watchful of. Also expense ratios, you know, where are you coming up with these expenses? Are the taxes going to go up over the next five years? I don't see that in the pro forma. So you just want to look at the numbers and ask a bunch of questions. Uh, any operator worth their salt will spend their time with you really answering all of your questions as to what is going on in the property and why they believe these particular um, numbers are, are going to be accurate, right? And then the track record is huge, right? Let me see your last 10 deals that you did or last couple of exits or whatever it is so that we can kind of get an idea of, uh, of your track record, right? The institutional partners that we partner with have 40 years experience and a billion dollars under management. You know, we're not uh, a small shop, right? We can provide all of that information. Um, so, you know, that's what you, you should be looking for. Anybody can give, can sell you a bill of goods, right? Anybody can <laughs> sell you that. Yeah, absolutely. I mean, the reason, part of the reason why I bring it up is for me, when, when I look at this and, and, and there's kind of two components, one we can talk as, as a second question about it, but one of the things is also to say, okay, what either has somebody, an operator like you as a general manager, general partner, already done as a legwork versus what still needs to to be done like you for example mentioned that this neglected property that you recently um, worked on and renovated and improved and got it all back together was in a war zone right like now not that's not literally but you know in in it was a, a rough part of town a rough part of town right and so one of the things that i found oftentimes is not that easy unless somebody wants to either do the legwork or your brochure is really, really extensive to say, assuming that we bring this property to the standards that we deem to be the right standards for the area, that doesn't automatically take away the fact that the area of the, in town is a war zone or whatever other term you want to use for it. And it's probably not common that you would renovate a whole neighborhood. Right. So how would somebody who is considering, hey, what Stephen says is really interesting and it's very passive and, and it allows me to just give some money and and then let him do his thing, which he does well and has a track record for. How do you handle this issue of we find a property which is probably not as easy as it used to be maybe 10 years ago to say a property that has the potential for all those improvements? without having to basically address the whole neighborhood that is maybe known as a rough part of town. Yeah. Yeah. It's a great question. So your rental comps are going to show you that and your sale comps are going to show you that, right? So just like in single family investing, if you're buying something for 60 cents, 65 cents on the dollar, then you know that the comps are the comps, right? That even though that area is maybe a little rougher, this is what it produces in terms of rents. And this is what it produces in terms of cap rate for sales. So it's, uh, it's just, again, a function of underwriting to see, can we get it there? What's it going to take to get it there? Here's our capital plan. Here's our budget. Here's our timeline. And here's what the place right across the street is renting for, which is not going to be as nice. And that's what we're conservatively underwriting, right? If yeah, we get above that, doing, great. If not, that's okay. Are you doing anything in the sense of saying, well, if we improve it and it's not right in the middle of the war zone, we might be able to attract people who would otherwise not have even considered that part of town? Yeah. So, I mean, we always look at gentrification, right? And that's exactly why we bought this property, because it was just on the outside of kind of the rougher area where there has been a lot of gentrification. There is new building going up. There are new shopping centers and things like that. There's a new bus line. So, we knew that over the next couple of years, the property value was going to go up just based on how fast the city was expanding. Very good. Yeah. And I think that's an important thing for people who are maybe not that familiar or considering to work with you on a deal like that for the first time um, to ask those kind of questions. The other thing I think might be interesting because I'm always advocating and I wonder what you're saying about it, but part of the reason why most of the people that come to us wonder can I even do it in the first place and how much money do I really bring need to bring to the table and I mean it has changed a little bit but I'm still saying if you have twenty thousand dollars you can buy a hundred thousand dollar property right now this brings up this one aspect that some people keep pointing to and I wonder what you would say about it is uh, accredited versus non-accredited in the context of syndications can you say a little bit about that in terms of like who's allowed into them? 
Yeah, can anybody, is it, do you differentiate if it's a particularly large deal that is only for accredited investors or is there some risk assessment where you would say, okay, well, this may or may not go as well. So we want to only have sophisticated investors rather than somebody who spent five years getting $25,000 together or something. Yeah, so quick um, definition, right? Acc accredited investors, you have a million dollars in net worth outside of your primary residence, or you've made $200,000 in the last two years as a single person or $300,000 a year as a married sure. couple with the same expectation to make that in the next coming years. That means you're accredited. If you're non-accredited, but sophisticated, it just means you don't hit those benchmarks, but maybe you are a real estate investor. Maybe you've done some stock investing. Maybe you have some liquidity. Um, <clears throat> so we have actually only done 506 Bs, which allow us to do both sophisticated and accredited investors in those deals. It just means we can't publicly advertise our deal flow. So if you go to my Facebook page, you're not going to see, hey, we're raising money for this deal. Here's the rates of return. You know, we have to right, have right. a personal relationship, yeah. right? A substantive mm -hmm. business relationship, as the SEC calls it. So what that means is most people that come to us, they go into our investor club, they sign up, they get on a call with us, they understand a bit about our business. We talk to them about their financial goals and it is not for everybody, right? I mean, if somebody's yeah, taking yeah, totally. five years to put together for 25 grand, we don't think that this is probably the right place for them to start. Now, it's not to say that you can't get there. It's just to say uh, we have some of these bigger deals, especially we have uh, minimums in the fund or into the deal that we're doing um, just because of management, just because capital management, right? Uh, yeah, I mean, you'd probably know that especially one very brazen, loud, noisy guy down in Florida has been trying desperately to convince everybody that it's for everyone, right? And I don't know how well that's going anymore right now, but... Uh, it's going well for him. Well, right. it's always been going well for him, right? Yeah. Like, um, no, anyway, um, and and I have always said, you know, the principle of the 10x stuff that he has uh, been pushing is not a bad principle. You just got to be careful to the point. And maybe uh, it might be helpful. You spoke and differentiated between accredited, non-accredited, and kind of in the middle, if it sounded like you say there is something like sophisticated. So you may not hit all the requirements by the numbers. So where do you draw the line? What would you say sophisticated means in the deals that you're offering? Yeah, I mean, for us, right, and it's self-defined because the, the IRS and right. the SEC don't define it. But for me, I'd like to see um, people making at least six figures a year, mm -hmm. right? And I, I'd like to see at least, you know, half a million dollars in investable assets or, or net worth. Right. So it doesn't have to necessarily hit that million dollar threshold, but I can't take your last 50 grand. Right. And are you are you looking grand. are you looking at those assets within something that is um, considered value investing, like, you know, real estate or, or gold or silver or stuff like that? Or can it be anything? No, it could, it could be a blend of, you know, alternative and traditional investment vehicles. Most people, frankly, don't have enough education on on the art alternatives. You know, so, I mean, I have plenty of people that have had, you know, multiple six figures in the stock market for 20, 30 years, and they just didn't know that they could do stuff like this in real estate. So absolutely. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> on the so, other, you have that on the other end of the spectrum too, where you might now find more people that have actually all kinds of money in crypto. You know? Yeah. Right. Exactly. <laughs> <laughs> so, okay. Uh, great. Well, I think uh, for the audience, it's a little more clear now uh, what it means. What is the syndication? What are the requirements? How do I get into it? So we have a few questions that I like to ask everybody. Are you okay with that? Let's to, do it. Out? Okay. So um, who, if, if you had to name a few names, who would you name as people you admire? Uh, so uh, again, you know, a lot of these questions, right. I'll just preface this with, uh, are going to be based on kind of our Christian roots. So uh, yeah, that's cool. It's a, that's cool. it's a big deal for us, but, um, so <laughs> no I, I think, judgment. yeah, so I, I, you know, I, I think, uh, you got to admire, you know, regardless of your religious background, the, uh, the disciples that followed Jesus around, right. Every single one of them tried to keep and obey his commandments and all got martyred and killed for it and never once changed their mind on it. And, you know, to me, there's just no um, better representation of consistency and character than somebody that will walk that out. So, so Judas counts or doesn't? No, I wouldn't say that he counts. <laughs> <laughs> okay, just just checking. But know. it's a good question, right? You do. I mean, I'm sure he had the opportunity to be forgiven too, but he, he walked away from it. So. <laughs> 
Um, and then, you know, so, and then, <laughs> and then in terms of business, um, you know, there's a couple of people that I admire, uh, very much in terms of like their consistency and ethos. And, uh, you, you got to respect Warren Buffett for what he's been able to do. Um, and you know, for, for the more new kind of school business owners, uh, there's a gentleman by the name of Alex or Mosey who owns a company called Jim launch. And, uh, he has some great content and some great books and he's built, um, a company that does over a hundred million dollars a year and he's 30 years old and he's just an absolute, uh, beast when it comes to business. Yeah. There are some people like that on Buffett. Is it just the result or any principles that you would say? Make it yeah. Make? I mean, he's just principled in, as an investor, right? He doesn't, um, he doesn't violate his own core values of investing. His, his tenants are long-term, right? They're not short-term quick bucks, but right, you know, right. what he's built over a lifetime is incredible. And the, yeah, the absolutely. Tenants, the tenants work. Yeah. And I, I mean, um, He wouldn't necessarily uh, be my number one, but one thing I really always admired about him is that he sticks to his principles, right? For me, it was always when people say, well, why didn't you do what Stephen did, right? Like he did flipping and then he did single family and multifamily and storage and syndication. And one of my answers um, is, in a sense, like Buffett, I like to do the stuff I understand. Right. And maybe I'm too lazy to learn new stuff, <laughs> but that's uh, one of the reasons that, you know, I've through my military career have been stationed at so many places and constantly had to decide, okay, do we rent, do we own, do we keep it, do we sell it and so mm. forth. So it became something that I was familiar with before I ever really saw it as an investment. And um, so I stuck with what I know right, and what I got to know. So that's a cool thing that the second question There's riches uh, in the niches. Yeah. <laughs> That's true. Um, so that was the first question. Uh, the second question I want to ask is if you had a time machine that could take you forward or backward, where would you go and why? Yeah. So I, I gave this question some thought because it's just been, um, it's been a crazy couple of years, right? Mm -hmm. So part of me would like to just go back to Wuhan, right? And make sure that this virus doesn't escape so that we can all get back to normal life. Um, But I think, I, I think realistically, uh, going back to when my, um, when my father-in-law was a child, right, into like the, the 40s and 50s and understanding that depression era uh, mentality of the greatest generation is certainly something that I would uh, enjoy, the wisdom that was imparted, the, I, all the way back to the reading level of the newspapers, right? There was a, it was just a different time. Yeah, absolutely. Um, where yeah. people honored values and, and really um, there, there wasn't without challenge there as well. But I think I'd like to enjoy that for a, a day or a week or something like that. Yeah, absolutely. Um, well, maybe I can, can get you a little closer to that if that's something you're looking for. Um, I recently read and then also went and ch checked out some of the speeches and presentations from Stephen Howe, who wrote co-wrote the book, The Fourth Generation. Mm. Uh, not uh, the, the fourth turning, sorry, the, the fourth turning. Called the fourth turning, but what it actually addresses is how do long cycles work? And I, adv uh, I would recommend for anybody listening or watching us uh, to consider this. Uh, he went back all the way, like for several hundreds of years, partially to say, okay, how has economy evolved, you know, currencies and values and how has real estate or money or all those kind of things evolved over long-term uh, circles and found out that most of these cycles are about 80 to 100 years long. And when you look at the trajectory, they have a similarity to the four seasons that we experience during a year, like the spring, summer, fall, and winter. Mm. And these seasons being 20 to 25 year long periods are very much attached or, or you can find representation in the generation of people who get born at the beginning of the season and then live the first 20, 25 years and then the next generation, next generation. The numbers, you can debate the numbers if it's exactly 20 or 25 years or something. But to your point about the great generation, he basically for our current time uh, states that the cycle, according to him, started around between uh, 1915 to 1920. Hmm. If you say 80 to 100 years, we're basically at the end of one of those really long cycles. And what's also interesting is that he determines spring as the time that you mentioned to go to with the time machine. 
right? The wars were over two relatively shortly after each other world wars. The economies were in totally different stages, technology, all these kind of things. And that kind of brings up the question, why are they called the great generation? He spends a, a pretty considerable amount of time explaining that. And also what people who lived through that, why, and maybe we are not that far apart in age, why did they raise us in the way they raised us? Right. Right. And how, how do we, as in our generation, raised our kids and how do they raise their kids and what the environmental and economic circumstances are. So if you're interested without having that time machine, as a yeah. hypothetical, no, that's great. the fourth turning is definitely a, a way to, to get a little closer to that. So last question um, would be independent of investing in stuff like that. Uh, and you said you probably have a, a Christian answer for that one too. What's the meaning of life for Stephen? Mm. Yeah, so I think... <clears throat> to love God and keep his commandments, right? And that that goes to how we treat people, that goes to how we treat our families and, uh, you know, everything like that. There's no shortage of need in the world. You know, part of what um, our business does is called investing with purpose. We, we have a donor advised fund where we carve out a percentage of all the dollars that come through our business for uh, nonprofits around the world. We've done some really cool things just in the last month. Um, digging wells in Kenya that support 1,200 people, giving 22,000 survival bags to um, people in, China, in uh, Thailand that feeds a family of five for two weeks. Uh, all, all kinds of uh, need in the world that we can support through our businesses and our investors support by partnering with us. So, yeah, that's very cool. Business. Awesome. Okay, well, that that sounds really good. So I'm I'm kind of suspecting that. Some people might say this kind of relatively hands-off approach that you uh, uh, or have described combined with somebody who doesn't just put integrity in the name, but actually lives it. How do I get in touch with Stephen and his outfit and, and see if I'm at least sophisticated, if not <laughs> yeah. if not accredited <clears throat> no it's great so i mean you could go to our website integrityhg.com and you can sign up for the investor club there's a bunch of free resources on there as well that you can kind of read through you can see the nonprofits that we're partnering with uh if you want to hear me talk and rattle on and on you can listen to our <laughs> podcast um it's called free from wall street so free from wall street is the name of our podcast and we basically just teach people how to create wealth through real estate versus the roller coaster ride of the stock market. Absolutely. Awesome. Cool. Well, thank you again, Stephen, for making the time and giving us an explanation on how this whole syndication thing with integrity works. Awesome. Thanks for having me on. Appreciate it. Yeah, absolutely. Thanks for listening. And I hope you enjoyed today's episode of the Ideal Investor Show. More info and the links we mentioned during the show are in the show notes or you can go to our website at idealwealthgrower.com and find them there. Sign up for the Apple podcast link, the RSS feed, the Spotify link. And if you like to talk to me, please sign up for a strategy call at idealwealthgrower.com. So hopefully you want to share what you learned with your network and bring more people in. We are really eager to hear your comments. And until next time, be well, stay safe and ciao.